So I've always been a big fan of Sebastian Lake's coding adventures. I like to write coding articles that focus more on my thought process than the end result. It starts from hypothesis and usually devolves into a tangent or two. Over time, I found that videos, rather than articles, seem to be a more engaging medium to showcase this. So without further ado, here is Coding Deep Dive, a series very different from coding adventures and you can't prove that it's not. I was recently sent a tweet that showcased something unusual. You see, when a snippet of JavaScript was pasted into Developer Console, some text would be revealed that wasn't previously visible. The person that sent me this tweet was curious how it worked, so I got to analyzing the JavaScript snippet. As an aside, if someone sends you a snippet of JavaScript and you aren't certain what it does, do not execute it. It can be malicious. This particular snippet looped over each character in a tweet, and if it contained a character whose code point is between two specific numbers, it was replaced with a character from an associated code point, described with this expression. A code point is a number representing a character in Unicode. Every symbol in Unicode has its own code point. You can think of it like an index or ID. So this expression takes the specific character's code point, the number associated with it, and then subtracts it by the hexadecimal number E0000, or 917,504. The resulting number is then converted back into a character. The original hexadecimal number is somewhat arbitrary, actually. You could do this with anything, but it might not make a whole lot of sense. This is Russian. We can use the same technique to convert English characters back into their encoded format. But why exactly are these characters invisible? By throwing the character or its code point into a Unicode lookup website, we find that it's called a tag. Wikipedia tells us that tags are Unicode blocks containing formatting tag characters. There's been a lot of back and forth in deprecating them, but they're essentially symbols that are purposely invisible. They were originally used to embed metadata into text, but we get to use them for this sort of stuff. But this made me interested in something else. You see, in late 2014, this tweet circulated around where the author suggested a little prank to pull on your fellow coders. The semicolon and Greek question mark are certainly different symbols, but they look incredibly similar. Replacing someone's semicolons with these might make them a bit frustrated when their IDE or code editor doesn't seem to recognize all their semicolons. Fortunately, most compilers and IDEs these days are aware of this prank and actually explain what's happening. So how else can we leverage our knowledge of Unicode to mess with our coworkers or coder friends? This will got me thinking about variable names. Can we use our Unicode knowledge to mess with our friends' variable names? Well, first off, what is a valid variable name? We're going to be using JavaScript for this. As far as I can tell, the max variable name length seems to be just as long as the max string size, so we can't do anything there. As for general variable name rules, there are a few well-known ones. We can't start with a number, we can't use spaces or new lines and less than an object, and we can't use reserved keywords like if, while, let, or const. But there are some interesting things we can do. We can use what's often referred to as Zago text, where we stack diacritics on top of diacritics to make this unholy mess. We can use some small ASCII art too. This is a valid name. It's actually just two aspirated unvoiced subapical palatal plosives separated by an underscore. Pronounced kind of like ta ta. They're from Canada, a language from southwestern India. But we can use non language characters too. We can use Roman numerals, the lambda symbol, the pi symbol, this weird dot which looks a lot like a period. We can't use emojis and, no, unfortunately we can't use those invisible zero-width characters from earlier in the video. So let's automate this and find out which ones we can use. We're going to use JavaScript Canvas to try and find the smallest characters possible. This works based on pixels and font sets, which means that we might actually get different results with different operating systems. We want to make sure that these are valid variable names though. There are a couple of ways of doing this. One is just using it as a variable and seeing if the engine yells at us. The one I went for involves regex or regular expressions. In recent JavaScript, we're able to check for valid variable names using category matchers and id start. The category matcher backslash p can match valid numbers, language characters, and also valid variable names. The spec tells us that valid variable name starting characters are tagged with id start. Running our web application, we get a bunch of symbols. We'll use these two because I found them to be consistently cross-platform. These are Hangul filler characters, and no, they're not considered whitespace. If we use dot .trim, nothing changes. We can scatter these around inside variable names. Yes, that's one variable name, and yes, it hurts to look at. But we're not done with our search yet. You see, you might know that you can't start a variable name with numbers, but anywhere past the first character is free real estate. Are there any other characters like this? The answer may surprise you. But it also might not, I don't know you. The answer is yes, there are. There are, there are other characters like this. These such characters fall into their own category, called id continue. 
Using a similar regex, we can try finding those as well. Wow, that's a lot more. I'm going to use these 16. They're called variation selectors. They may modify certain characters when placed after them, but not many, if any, English ones as far as I can tell. So for the most part, they're just invisible characters that we can insert inside variable names. This is what I was looking for. It's kind of difficult to copy-paste since there's zero width, but we can see just how frustrating this might be for someone. These two variables look exactly the same, but they aren't. The error messages are cryptic. So how do we use our newfound power for evil? Babel plugins. Babel is a self-described JavaScript compiler, but we're going to call it a transpiler just to confuse everyone. Essentially, it lets us transform JavaScript from one format to another. We can add additional functionality, create macros, support older browsers, or screw with everyone by adding invisible characters inside their variable names. This might look a bit complex at first, but what we're doing is injecting ourselves into what's called an AST, or abstract syntax tree. We don't care about the specifics, but whenever we pass by a variable name, we're going to mess with it. We want to make each variable unique, so we keep a counter of the number of variables we have already transformed and use that to get a list of invisible characters we end up using. We just run it and... Ah, horrible. Nice. And because I'm not that much of a monster, here's the Babel Transformer to reverse this mess. And that's just about as far as we're going to get for this episode. We've covered a fair bit, but there's really so much more to cover. For a little bit more content on the same subject, check out the links below in my follow-up video where I discuss some more interesting aspects of Unicode and its practical application. Some things that couldn't fit into this video.